when Mr. Min Lynch uh, approached me about doing a scholar project, I told him, okay, uh, but it has to be an engineering project that you do, so you're a decky. And, and uh, after you see his presentation, you can be a judge of that. I think he did a great job at that. Uh, but he did it by acquiring the characteristics of a submarine. He would uh, come, come to shore, talk to me a little bit, and disappear for two weeks and go underwater. And uh, he'd come back, and he's doing great progress. And uh, he behaved really <coughs> autonomously, so it uh, made my job uh, quite, quite easy. So I turn it over to uh, Mr. Lynch. Sounds good. All right, guys, well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Um, I know that the midshipmen missed grilled chicken in Delano for this, so that was big. And then Dean Ballard and all the faculty uh, showing your support as well. That means a lot to me. Um, what you see spinning right, right here behind me uh, is something I've been working on for the past eight months or so. Um, my friends know that I could talk about it for hours on end, but I'll, I'll spare you all that and I'll just give you the highlights. So the title of my presentation is Subsea Performance Efficiency and Robotic Applications. And I'll get into the efficiency side of things in just a second, but that was mainly uh, the materials, the power consumption, the programming, and then what I could use on campus to get the job done. So how did I actually get interested in all of this? Um, it started out when I was a, I guess, when I was in high school, I did a robotics club, um, which, which sparked my interest there. But when I came here as a sophomore, um, I think Dr. Wei had this, pres had this project that we had to do, and it was research a company. And I chose Oceaneering, who some of you guys might be familiar with them. Um, they do crazy uh, subsea research. They do uh, industrial solutions down to like two, 3,000 meters of water depth, and the pressure down there is incredible. So fast forward from that out to sea year, and I had a ton of free time during my sea year, so I thought uh, maybe I'm on, this, I'm on this really cool ship. So I was on a cable laying ship that had this ROV. This is the Narius 4, and it's a cable laying and inspection ROV. And so I thought, you know, this is really cool. I wonder if I can come up with something that's got some industrial application as well. And uh, while this is uh, just a very baby step in that direction, uh, that was kind of where I started. So I had the, the programs on my computer and I started designing while I was at at sea and I'll take you through the design process. And it was pretty rudimentary at first, still is, but uh, we'll get there. And then I also started looking at the materials that I was going to have to use, um, the cost, and then who, who was going to pay for it? Was I going to pay for it? Uh, was I going to try and get the school to pay for it? Uh, but it was really starting out on this cable length ship that sparked my interest in ROVs. So I come back to King's Point. This is definitely not a stage picture here. Um, I come back to King's Point and I start poking around and some of my friends uh, recommended that I uh, try and find a faculty who could sponsor it as a KP Scholar project. So that's what I did. I got together a list of the materials that I would need. Um, could I 3D print everything on campus? And actually, a little side story there. Um, when I was out at sea, I, I texted Joe Schumacher and I was like, hey, uh, what's, what 3D printer do we have on campus? Because I want to design it around the restrictions of that 3D printer. And he's like, oh, we have the Lulzbot TAS-6. So I chose that as my, like, my, my parameters for everything that I was going to print, and that's what you see right here. Um, I also started looking at the, whether or not I could do it with this 3D printer, the hydrodynamics of the shape, how water would flow around it. Um, could I test it when I was back on campus? and then simulations as well. Uh, what kind of power systems I was going to be using? Was, was I gonna power from the surface or batteries on board? Um, and then what kind of programming was I gonna to have to learn to make this a reality? I was looking at Python, Arduino, and then Linux, if you consider Linux programming. Um, so moving right along, these were some of my very first prototypes. The one on the far left is a quarter scale model, and you can see how much it's changed since, since then. Um, and that's a flashlight in the background to give you a scale. And actually, Chris Kale's little car in the middle there is supporting it. Um, and then in the middle here is a half-scale model that I printed to do testing in the pool. And that was when I, was, I needed to find, uh, calculate the drag forces. And I'll cover that in just a second. And then the far right is something I scrapped completely. Uh, but it just goes to show how quickly, these were maybe two hours. Uh, maybe the middle one was a 10-hour print. Um, but I was able to uh, prototype really rapidly and then visualize it uh, right in front of me there. So th then we did some pool testing. Uh, we dropped it from a known height, and then with that distance, uh, we could calculate the speed, and with the speed, we could get the drag coefficient, start to see the forces that were gonna be um, on the model, and here's some pictures of us uh, doing that. Uh, Dr. Perez was dropping it from the surface, and I was in the pool with a little watch timing it there. Uh, that was back in September. So we had the practical uh, results from the pool, but I also wanted to uh, try and use technology. So I'm all about technology. I figured I could do some simulation. 
So uh, Dr. Perez introduced me to computational fluid dynamics with a program called ANSYS Fluent. Some of you guys, uh, the, the fluids guys probably have heard of that or used it before. Um, in fact, you probably know a lot more about it than I do. But I was able to pretty much replicate uh, the results in the pool in the simulation uh, down to less than 13% error. And I was pretty pleased with that number because it was a very rudimentary test and I think the swim team was practicing in the background too. Throwing, <laughs> definitely not a static environment. Um, so I was pretty happy with that result. And then one little cool phenomenon here, you can see the vortex shedding, the Carmen vortex streak, this like oscillation as the, wave, as the uh, fluid comes off the body. And that was pretty cool to see. We knew it was an unstreamlined body going into it, um, but it was still pretty cool to see and really powerful to visualize the fluid flow um, before I even started printing at all. So here's some more pictures of it. This is a side view of the most current model. Um, you can see the vortices forming around the back. These are streamlines and the scale is from zero to two, but I set the inlet flow at one meter per second because that's the speed that I predicted um, that the ROV would be moving at, at least initially. Um, and then here's another one that's uh, streamlined and then the contours, so you can see the fluid flow there, uh, red being the fastest flow. And here's another view from the top, vortices forming again in the back, and then uh, contour. <coughs> really cool tool to visualize what the flow is going to look like. So this is, this is my design. So I started when I was out at sea, and I had this crazy design. I thought I'd been practicing TIG welding for a while. I thought I was going to do all this crazy TIG welding, cut out all this aluminum. And I got back to school, and I was you know, playing around with the TIG welder a little bit. And I was like, you know what, I really don't know what I'm doing here. I'm going <laughs> to move on to something different. Um, and that would have been a crazy amount of man hours trying to TIG weld those tiny, like these little joints right here. It would have been nuts. Um, but there is a lot of 3D printing on this model. So I shifted over to this. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to CNC plasma cut all this aluminum. It's going to be amazing. I'm going to learn how to do CNC plasma cutting. And then I realized I also don't know how to do that. So I should probably scrap that for, for now as well, uh, given the timeline that I had. So this is a 3D printed one as well. Uh, moving along, this I, I changed the design quite a bit. This is a version 3 from the side and from the top. And it's a very big boxy design. But this was a pretty big shift for me because I... I scrapped aluminum completely and I focused on just 3D printing. And this is a huge part, which I'll get into in a second. I experimented with all kinds of crazy models. I even thought that I was going to divert the flow around like an electronics box in the middle for a second. Uh, that was also not a good idea. So I came upon this idea, and this is pretty close to the final. This is symmetrical and it's all 3D printed in one, two, three, four, six different parts. Um, so I split it down the middle and then printed those six pieces. Uh, on the 3D printer. And I like that design, but it, it wasn't quite, I, so my goal is efficiency. So I ended up going to this design right here. And this is the design you see up front. And the idea here was to streamline the flow over the body. And the teardrop is like the ideal shape for fluid flow. And so that's what I did for this model. And I was, I was limited by the 3D printer, one, because I'm not an expert, and two, uh, because when you're printing parts of that size, it literally took up the entire print bed. The chances of it warping off the print bed are pretty high, and I had that happen to me numerous times. Um, and this is actually a good time to explain what the name Doris means. So I had to come up with a name with it for it, and I was looking around, and like Ben Starr told me, hey, you should check out Greek gods or something like that. So I looked up uh, the Greek mythology, and Doris is the Greek sea nymph, the goddess of the bounty of the sea. So I figured that was fitting. And then it's the military, so it has to have an acronym. It's got to be an acronym for something. So I named it Deep Operation Robotic Information System. So that's the story behind that. Yeah. Um, so moving into the construction phase, some things that I had to learn before I even got started with the, with the final model construction, I've been doing 3D printing before, um, but this is the final model, um, was 3D printing, of course, and then programming. I had to calculate the buoyancy and figure out how I was going to waterproof it. And then also set up, build my own network for this thing because you have to be able to communicate with it from the surface. And so I, I looked into a little bit into network architecture. This is a picture of my room at one point. I've got stuff spread out all over the place. I had to uh, assure my friends that I was not building a bomb at many points when they came into my room. That was uh, with the chemicals and the wires, you might, you might be tempted to think that, but that was not the case. This is the 3D printer that, we've ha that we have actually in the back room, and I put hundreds, maybe a thousand hours on this printer um, printing these different parts, 
and prototyping and then the final model. I, I set up this, this spool here to spool out five kilograms of plastic into the extruder. There's the extruder, here's the top piece you can see right here, and then um, here's one of the shell pieces. And if anyone's done any 3D printing before, they would know that with the scale printer that we have, printing parts of that size with that much plastic is pretty hairy. Like there's a lot of things that could go wrong and I definitely ran into that uh, with a lot of warped or failed parts throughout the build process. So here, moving into the assembly a little bit more, I've got it spread out there, uh, not assembled quite yet on the far left. The middle is the computer system that I put together for this. It's, it's running a Raspberry Pi, if anyone has ever heard of that. Uh, it's a single board Linux computer. So a computer fully functional just like this, running a different, different operating system, Linux, um, but it handles a web server that I put together. I can't take credit for that. That's a program that I found online. It's an open source program um, that runs a uh, client server interaction that I actually stumbled upon. I didn't realize that I could do this, but the server that I'm running on the computer actually inside the ROV is broadcasting to my network. I've got a router that, that I'll go into in a second, but the bottom line is any client, customer, uh, researcher, anyone with a phone that has wireless access or tablet, whatever, can connect to the network that I set up, go to the IP address of the Raspberry Pi, say 10.0.0.5, just plug that into their browser, the URL, and then they get a live stream of the camera in real time on their phone. And that's not connected to the internet, that's a local area network. So imagine you're out on a boat, you don't have internet, you just connect to the, the, to the router that I've got going there and you can see a live stream on your phone, which I just stumbled upon and I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, here's another picture of uh, my electronics box and I had to figure out a way to waterproof it and that ended up being pretty pro problematic, but I'll get into that in a second. So I created all my own wiring in this little plug that you can plug in that's got uh, three leads from each motor that you can just plug in there right there. I also created what I call the surface support box, um, which has a wireless router that I was talking about. You can, it's hard to see, but there's a wireless router right there with a local area network. It's also got a battery charger and a parallel board, and then I created all my own wiring harnesses for these two batteries. These are two uh, 3,000 3, milliamp hour batteries that, when combined, give me plenty of discharge current and plenty of power for the ROV. Uh, additionally, inside the box, I've got an inverter, because this thing runs off just 120 AC most of the time, but a uh, battery backup if you want to run the router um, as well. In the middle is my electronics box that I 3D printed, and I'll get into the tolerances in just a second, but uh, this actually slides down over that middle column. And then these are the batteries, just the way I wired it up. So getting into the 3D printing a little bit more, this is the top piece, and I was the extruder head itself on the 3D printer mm -hmm. is half a millimeter in diameter. But by playing with the settings, I was able to get the tolerances down to a quarter of a millimeter, which I thought was really cool uh, with that printer in particular, because this thing fits like a glove right down over on top of the um, electronics box. And that was, that was pretty, that was very important in waterproofing it. Uh, here's a picture of a voltage board that I was using. And then this is the scale of the computer. So this is the full blown computer right here. And that's my hand. So you get an idea of the scale there. Uh, some of the features, the control system that I wrote is based on an open source library called Pygame. And it's actually a little bit more advanced. This is a, uh, an old picture, but it's a little bit more advanced than, it is, than it's shown here. Um, but I put together a control program using Python, uh, which gives the operator extremely low latency control over the, the ROV's actual direction. And again, you can live stream to any clients connected on the network with this all on this computer that I've got inside the ROV. Um, you can quickly swap out the battery packs, like I mentioned. Um, and then there's also an accelerometer and a moisture sensor in there as well. This is the flight simulator joystick that I was using, and here it is actually right here. So you've got control of uh, the thrusters both independently and together uh, for forward and reverse, and then this is pitch, and then you've got yaw here. Um, you can control the, the heading just like that. And then I added some other features, like you press a button and it'll return to the surface, and uh, if you hold the trigger, it'll be all stop. <clears throat> So here's a quick video that I want to show you uh, from our <coughs> most recent testing. Just a minute long. That uh, zip tie right there is for easy access to the batteries. In reality, and that's why I have right here. In reality, it's screwed in. 
<laughs> Excellent control on the surface as well. One of the biggest limitations with this was the horizontal control, limited by that one thruster, which I'll talk about in just a second. But towards the end, by adjusting the batteries, we were able to get good control horizontally. some of the pictures here just on the surface testing these are different iterations that we did when we first started out actually I had foam in the voids all around there's void space in here and I had foam in there because I thought I, I calculated and I knew that there was gonna be about 11 pounds of extra buoyancy but I didn't realize how hard it was going to be to adjust that buoyancy and to add weight so we ended up grabbing a couple plates and we needed 11 pounds to get it to sink down initially which is a good thing because you want it to be buoyant from the start instead of trying to raise an object that just sinks so that was good um, here's some other pictures on the surface and some more uh, testing that we did. Here's some more. And by the end, like I said, adjusting those batteries, we were able to get pretty good horizontal stability, even with just that one thruster. So you're probably wondering, okay, you're, you're, the title of your presentation was Subsea Performance Efficiency in Robotic Applications. So how is this thing actually efficient? What I was able to do is, from the very start, using computational fluid dynamics and then the pool testing, I was able to refine my design to cut down on the drag coefficient, uh, which makes it a more streamlined object through the water, um, which, which was pretty helpful, I, th I think, in the end. And it also just improved the general look of my design as well. Having three thrusters on board, though it is problematic in some cases with hor horizontal stability if your center of gravity isn't perfect, um, it's extremely power efficient compared to um, other undergraduate ROVs that you might have seen on YouTube with four or six or even eight thrusters. The 3D printing dramatically cuts the costs. After you recover the cost of the machine, the total plastic in this is worth about $50. So that's, that's an incredible savings there, plus the ability to quickly prototype things. And then finally, the, the simple program that I was able to put on the, the computer on board runs at a 6% processor load. So I'm running a control program, a web server, an accelerometer program, and a moisture sensor at 6% processor load. So that thing absolutely sips power. And then even after an hour of medium to light duty operation, I only used about 15% of the batteries, and that was in the, the fourth test that we did. In the fifth test that we did, uh, we ran it hard. My friends will attest to that. And we only used about 25% of the battery in a half an hour period of time. So that was pretty, pretty incredible. And these are uh, LiPo batteries, if anyone's familiar with battery technology. So they're high discharge and pretty, they, they basically go, 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 and then they fall off. So we, we were able to get good efficiency with these batteries. So what do I want to do with this thing in the future? I'd like to look at powering it from the surface through my dive support box for longer dive times. I think that's going to be critical on any uh, longer, say, industrial mission if we even get there. We, need, we definitely need to put some control, some thought into the horizontal stability, whether that's adding fins at the back or uh, maybe like little rudders behind here on servos to control the actual operation. Uh, and then we also need to, or I would like to build my own custom graphical user interface that gives clients or researchers full control and full view over what the operator is doing in real time. The camera, his control, what the joystick is actually doing, and then stream that on a web server so that anyone connected to my local area network, just like with the camera, can see exactly what the operator is doing. I'd like to increase the depth operation. I've got 100 feet of ethernet here, um, and we really only tested this in the pool, but I'd like to cut out those interior voids so it can dive deeper. Right now, um, it just gets, uh, if, if it were to go deep, the pressure would crush the interior. And then finally, it, those, who, those of you who are familiar with programming, um, know that functions are far more efficient than just regular blocks of code. So I'd like to, I have just blocks of code right now, I'd like to condense my work into functions 
um, and that would also simplify it for anyone who's going back and expanding or editing my code. And that's, that's pretty much my project. I d definitely have to say a few thanks. Um, first, from the midshipmen who helped me out. I've got Ethan Pieper helping me with Arduino. That was a huge help. Um, I've got John Donovan, uh, Jacob Wallen, Ethan Pieper again, Liam Wood, and, uh, and Heffernan helping me out in the pool with the testing. Um, Dr. Perez was an enormous help. Uh, just every time I had a question, I'd go to him and he would respond in an email within an hour or so. Um, and then Dean Taha, obviously, for supporting this project, and uh, Mr. Crook for putting the orders through. And then finally, the library staff. I was in here, I was in here so often, just 3D printing, and they always were there with the key, never annoyed. And so that was, that was really awesome. Um, and then finally, if, if you're interested in learning more about this project, I've got a website, uh, rovdoris.com, that you guys can check out, and I have the, pretty much the whole build documented on there. Uh, so that's my project, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, right after this, if you're interested, I'm going to do a demonstration with the controls so you guys can play around and see how it responds. If you'd like to stay, stick after and play with it, then you're welcome to. But any questions? No questions. In the back. Yeah, sure. Um, so the CFD uh, modeling that you did, right. I saw some in the beginning. Was that of the final design, or did you do that of the initial design and then use that to update the final design? There was two components to the CFD testing that I did. The testing in the beginning that I did was of that half scale model. That's what my graphs and results are for because that's what we tested in the pool and that's what I could compare. The streamlines though that I put together are for the final streamline model or the, this final model. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Yeah. So this is the teardrop shape and you can see um, that's I use the final model for my visualization. Uh, that, that's pretty much. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Okay, Thank great. Very yep. well done. Thank One you. Other question, if you don't mind, yeah, sure. Is about waterproofing. Yeah. Um, I know uh, from 3D printing, most of the time it's very porous material. Right. Do you have to coat the surface with like a glue or something to get water from not penetrating through? I did, and I'm really glad you asked that because I forgot to talk about that in my presentation. Um, so what I did to combat that was I printed 100% solid, which is not ideal. There's still going to be some, some porous element there, um, but that definitely helped. And then I coated it initially with, with Flex Seal, and that, was, that seemed to work pretty well. Um, and I had some successful tests with that. But when that, I had some other issues with the ports that I'm using, the pass-throughs for cables. So I ended up coating the edges with silicone. Any part there was an, an open edge, I would coat with uh, industrial silicone that the waterfront guys recommended recommended to me, and Chief, uh, Chief Mark Sorochinsky down at the waterfront was a huge help with that. Um, but I coated the edges, and then you can actually come up and see afterwards, a lot of it is exposed plastic. It's just 100% solid, and that worked, that worked well. So. Yeah. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Is that for? Uh, at the beginning, you were talking about uh, deciding between going with a battery or surface power. What was the deciding factor in going with, obviously, surface power? Right. Well, I, went, I actually went with um, oh, battery well, power. Yeah. yeah, this is actually just an Ethernet cable, okay. so just network connection. Um, the reason I went with battery power was <clears throat> in talking with mainly uh, the chief on the King's Pointer, the danger, because of voltage loss over a, over a long distance of wire, uh, the danger of an amateur like myself sending down 48 volts DC, which is what I would need over that voltage, uh, voltage drop, the danger of sending that down was just not something I was ready to take on, especially since I was going to be in the pool working with it initially. <laughs> so, so that's why I went with battery power. I was yeah. able to get that. Uh, I only have 12 volts DC on there, okay. so that was why. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Perez. I think you're the fourth or fifth scholar. Um, he never says no to, uh, to someone who wants to do a King's Point Scholar project, and I think we all owe him a hand. And Absolutely. in addition, there is no King's Point Scholar program without Absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to reiterate that Dr. Perez has been huge help throughout the entire project. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? 
Yeah, Megan. What is your intent for like real world application materiality? So the purpose of this project from the start was really proof of concept. Could I design something and then 3D print the entire thing uh, using just what we have at the school? Um, real world would be to add another thruster <coughs> and to cut out those voids so we can go deeper. The camera's not on it right now, but the camera does work with that, with that uh, network that I set up. So really just a data collection vehicle. It's really cheap to reproduce probably reproduce it for 300 bucks. Imagine dropping 10 of these around a ship and getting some footage or something like that, dropping them down on a reef. It's got an oil spill, something like that. So that would be the real world application there. Wow, uh, Marty. Uh, when you were designing it, did you take into consideration that it might be able to perform in turbulent waters? Like, you know, in an ocean where it's not still right. water like a pool? Yeah, that's, I did take that into consideration. Uh, not as much as I should have, definitely looking back on it because that one thruster is a big limitation, even in the pool, uh, that was a big limitation. So in the ocean with currents, that's gonna be even more so. Um, but because this is 3D printed, the expandability and like, I could just redesign and add two thrusters, and then maybe I could do that with the, I could do that currently with the batteries that I have on board, uh, but maybe look at putting a bigger battery in there to support that. But yeah, I did consider the, tur the turbulence of being in the ocean, um, not so much with this model, because it was more proof of concept. Okay. Yeah, uh, in the back. So when you speak real world, how, and, and you talk about sealing this piece of plastic, right. how deep do you think you can take it? Right now, the only limitation is the electronics box. Well, I shouldn't say the only limitation. If this thing were to be dropped to 200, 300 feet, the plastic would probably start to deform um, in its given setup. Um, although this is 100% solid printed plastic, I think it would hold up uh, for quite a bit. But the, limit, the limiting factor here is the electronics box. and. To combat that, I'm thinking <clears throat> fill it with mineral oil because that will push the mineral oil is non-conductive and so the computers can operate inside of that box if it's filled with oil um, and then seal it up really tight. And so as the pressure increases, the mineral oil will combat that. So that's that's my idea of combating that. Any other questions? Yeah. Sam. You mentioned that when you were 3D printing, all of the material you were printing uh, didn't turn out the way you wanted. Was there a way you finessed it or was It was a lot of both, and I actually got to the point where I would sit there for like two or three hours during the start of every print because I didn't want it to fail, and I would fine tune it as it was printing those first couple layers uh, to make sure that it, it wouldn't print. It was absolutely a lot of trial and error though, getting the temperature of the extruder right, the temperature of the print bed, trying to get the room heated even so that there wouldn't be any deformation. Um, lots of trial and error, but I also had limited materials to work with, so I had to finagle it a little bit. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Would it be your recommendation that the Academy acquire another 3D printer? Hmm. Better 3D At this point, we've got two 3D printers. We could always have more. Um, I think as long as, <laughs> because, all right, so the reason, this is the reason we would always uh, want more. When, you're, when you are using a 3D printer, often the prints are 10 to 20 hours. In this case, these were, 48 to 96 hour prints a piece. So I was completely taking up that room, doing my own thing. And sometimes when shipment would come in, I'd have to leave a printer open for them, but I couldn't be printing the entire time. So acquiring more 3D printers, they're relatively low cost for what you can do with them. Um, so I would say absolutely. I, in terms of what the engineering department could acquire in that realm, um, I would say look into more advanced metal cutting and metal 3D printing. Uh, such as putting like a MIG welder on a six degrees of freedom robotic arm, something like that, because you can do much more advanced and much stronger parts with uh, metal, metal 3D printing, metal deposition. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Garofalo, a new faculty member, is actually going to be doing a three point solar project with the two students. Awesome. Um, so cool. close, so close to go. Thanks, Matt. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that would be that'd be awesome. I know you can do it on your phone now too. You can scan an object and then throw it on the printer. There's yes, ma'am. I see a, a real application for this in surveying for boats. Anytime you use the word yacht right. and survey, it, I'm going through one right now and it's very expensive. So if you don't have to pull the boat out of the water, right? Um, if the boat's been grounded, for example, it can be pretty survey. Cool. You can make a lot of money. Yeah, I would like ideally I'd like to put a couple more sensors on here. Uh, pressure, temperature, and then the, the sonar modules 
by the way, th this entire project, with the exception of the three D, uh, with, with the exception of the cable that came from McMaster, is off Amazon. So you could easily reproduce this project, and with a couple more sensors also available on Amazon, such as little sonar sensors, you could create a really cool three D mapping um, application. Yeah, Luke. Matt, would you ever be able to make it Bluetooth or completely wireless? Not with the current technology. Right now. There are researchers at MIT, it's always MIT, but there's researchers <laughs> at MIT developing wire, wireless communication in water, but because you have to use acoustics to communicate, right now you have to use acoustics to communicate data in water, um, it, the really you couldn't stream video over acoustics, it's just not, the bandwidth isn't there, um, and then there's a lot of issues with actually receiving the data sent. So Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are actually service applications. Um, this would be, it has to be wired for now, and that's why you see every in professional industrial ROV is wired. The autonomous ROVs that do exist, like Oceaneering has a couple, mm -hmm. they are battery powered and they're literally autonomous. They drop them in the water and they can d map their environment and then maneuver around that environment. But they're still, they, there's no control from the surface and this would require control from the surface. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Luke, uh, Neil. How would you account for low visibility, low visibility operations? Right, um, that would have to be a sonar sensor added in after the fact. Um, this doesn't have the capability for low light. Uh, I, I, I put together another order to continue this project that included an extremely bright LED light that I haven't put on this yet. But right now, uh, it would have to have really good visibility. But that's a really good point. Anybody else? Oh, I got one more. Yeah. Did it actually move one meter per second? I never measured that actually. Um, it probably moved faster than that. It seems fast. It seems quick. Yeah, it, it, we got it. Oh, the motors are scaled to, or they're reduced to one fifth of their actual operating power in the program that I put together. So at one fifth operating power, it moved probably three quarters of a meter per second. Um, if I was to scale that up, the power consumption would be a lot higher, but I think I could exceed one meter per second. Yeah, it moved pretty fast. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you very much for coming to our presentation. <laughs>